I'm not going to speak long to wrap up, but I do want to um, draw together some of the themes that I think have hung over uh, this meaning 2016 com conference, and, and be a bit more spiky than, than, than for the rest of the, of, the, of the time. Trump is not Hitler. Okay? Trump, is, Trump is not fascist. But Trump and Brexit and all the right-wing xenophobic stuff that's happening in Europe and the rest of the world is a big change. And I think it is a big challenge for those of us in business. Because what we've done and what the last 30 years have taught us to do has been something quite progressive. And it's like this. In, in the, in the post-war era of hierarchy, you, you had to basically bring one identity to work and leisure and life. And so it was seen as hypocrisy to be different at work than you were in your community. That was the classic working class uh, culture I grew up in. Anybody who was different in, any, in the pub, at work, in a bowling green, you know, would have been seen as a crazy person. But as sociologists noticed, the rise of the networked individual was also the rise of the multipolar character, the multifaceted person. So you're allowed to be the total company uh, nerd uh, in your company, and in fact live the dream, work your way up all the hierarchies, but, it's, but the company in return doesn't demand anything other than you, you do the work. And you turn up, this you know, was the quid pro quo for, you know, women's greater emancipation, gay liberation, the transgender revolution. You could turn up and basically you're just yourself. And I, I have seen this, one of the most amazing things was to see transgender people on a factory floor in the Midlands, entirely accepted, uh, I mean, a very out transgender uh, people in a very traditional male manual workforce. It, it brought it home when I covered this for, um, for, for Channel 4 News. What, what neoliberalism, what the free market brought, it brought this detachment of work from what you might call intrinsic values, but the, the supposition was at work we're all globalists. At work we all basically abide by um, corporate social responsibility, by human rights, by anti-sexism, anti-racism. Now, if you've been watching Question Time, what you realise, and if, even worse if you've been on the doorstep campaigning, is that people out there are beginning to use language that nobody can use inside a company. The things that the, the audience says on Question Time would not be allowable in most company meetings. Maybe in the odd haulage company or whatever, completely unreformed or you know, building, whatever. But not really. And so what's happening with this, this counter-revolution of values in society is that it is challenging companies to start asking themselves what they are as political beings. Now, Hannah, Hannah Arendt, uh, the anti-fascist liberal uh, German philosopher, did come up with something that I think has been pointed out, not by me, but by a, a US writer called Danielle Allen, uh, in response to the Trump victory. Um, Arendt is famous for saying the, the evil's banal, the banality of evil. But the other thing she said was that what helped uh, right-wing racism and, and xenophobia triumph in the 1930s was not only that some companies completely flipped over and supported it, uh, you'll know that, that, that many did, but that people who didn't support it became what she called internal exiles. And therefore they said, we've lost the battle, it's all over, I've still got my allotment, I've still got my, my ethical, you know, today it would be my ethical trading business, whatever. And I can go and do that because it, I can't influence events. And I would like to leave you with the thought that you can influence events and that your, the, the business model of most businesses, most self-employed professionals here is to have a globalised workplace, a globalised uh, multilateral currency system, a system of relatively free trade, albeit um, tempered by the need for human rights and ethical responsibilities, and that we actually have a responsibility to defend that. Now, what does that mean? I, I, I've said in an article I've written this, this, which has caused a bit of a kerfuffle, actually, among the people it was exactly aimed at, which was Hollywood. In my Art Guardian article this week, I said, look, from now on, every actor who auditions for every role has to ask, did my character vote for Donald Trump? Um, they have to ask, did my character in Britain, did they support Brexit? Did they 
tell Labour or the Greens or the Lib Dems to F off on the, on the doorstep when, when, when asked to support um, Remain. Um, so, so if that's true of Hollywood or the stage, it's true of your customers. You know, have to ask, when they walk into Lush or to um, any of the businesses who've, who've come today, what did they vote? Okay, what did they vote? And what do we think about that? Some businesses already will say, bring it on, good. Uh, we, they voted for this. Um, give the customer what they want. It's not our business. But I, I would caution against that because what you're getting sucked into is the deglobalization of the world. And soon you'll be asked to sign up for other things. You know, we're already talking about in America that they want to bring back the House American Non-Activities Committee, which is the, 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 the one, that, the, the McCarthyite one. And you see that many of us have thought, if I'd have been alive in the 30s, I would have opposed fascism. Or, you know, if I'd have been... Uh, if, if, Good old Alf Dubs, good old, you know, good old um, the kinder transport people. If I'd have been around in, in, the, you know, in the 30s, I would have helped the children come from Germany. Of course I would. Likewise in the 50s, we think, of course, if I'd have been in the 50s, I would have opposed the blacklist in Hollywood. I wouldn't have, you know, gone and testified to Congress that, you know, uh, as Edward G. Robinson did against uh, Dalton Trumbo, that he's a communist. Uh, under pressure, Robinson did this. Um, but somebody said, somebody very wise said, look, whatever you're doing now is what you would have done in the 1930s. Uh, if, if you went to Calais, you would have probably helped the kinder transport children. If you don't give a shit about Calais, you probably wouldn't have given a shit about the Jewish refugees. That's what we are at now. And I would ask you not to go away and become raving Trotskyist, lunatic, anarchist people or, or anything else. I was quite raving in my youth, but to think seriously about what businesses and professions can do in the light of what's happening, which is obviously we've got to keep things very uh, uh, civilised and humane and, and rational. Um, and, but we, I think we probably do have to break that uh, neutrality that business had over, you know, because it was seen as a kind of neutrality that was... Um, that was hospitable to many kinds of lifestyle. I don't think we should go in there and sack everybody who's a racist and a xenophobe. Far from it. I think we should engage them. But I think statements of values are the first thing because I think for going forward, what are the situation now, the breakup of the world system, the breakup of the consensus over liberality, means that everybody else is fighting for their values. You know, we heard what the values of some of these groups are. You've got to fight for yours and decide what they are and express them. And that's, that, that's going to be beyond some businesses. They're just, just not going to be up to it. I think we will, we, history will then judge you know, what, what, what the outcome is. But that after, once you've outlined your values, I think it's also down to us as individuals to choose how to act on them. And... You know, we're doing a lot of soul-searching, people in, involved in left activism, um, labour activist, momentum, etc. Have we been too um, diverse in what... Have we been too... Uh, spreading ourselves too thin? And I think we have. I know many people who, who spend you know, a lot of time going, worrying about one thing after another. And I think that what I'm going to do now is to, uh, taking away some of the lessons from today and the lessons of the weeks and months of covering this very scratchy summer that we've had, is that I'm going to concentrate on one thing that I'm interested in and then reserve energy, a, a quite a big chunk of energy, for one big thing that somebody else tells me is important. I think that's how I'm going to do things. Um, and I think what it means for companies, anybody with resources, is if, you com if you're worried about the fact that the American media is run by right-wing billionaires, find some left-wing billionaires and take over or create an alternative media. If you're worried about the fact that there's no social cohesion in your area, find somebody who has put their, you know, their 10 grand crowdfunding into some pathetically damp and useless um, community centre and turn it into a brilliant, uh, non-pathetic, fully uh, functioning community centre. And I think all these things are like anteing up to the world as it's going to become for us because you, if you're thinking, shit, what is happening? You're not alone. Um, the, 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 fi the, the thing about populism, and, and it's a hard thing to say, but let me say it, is that when we're faced with dictators, when we're faced with autocrats, let's remember what the people in Tiananmen Square shouted, do not fear tyranny, because there are more of us. And likewise, you know, the people on 
Tahrir Square during the Arab Spring said, you know, when the people decide to live, all the chains are broken because they understood the power of large numbers. What populism is, right-wing populism above all, is the threat to use large numbers against you. And there is an answer to it. And it has nothing to do with repression. It's nothing to do with, 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 with forcing one force of one group against another. It is making people understand the overhead cost of going down that route. There's nowhere in Europe and nowhere yet in America where anybody in power has been prepared to use the power of large numbers of reactionary people against large numbers of progressive, globalist, and educated people. But there is somewhere, and that's Turkey, where currently, you know, a thousand journalists, you know, hundreds of academics, many people who've done nothing at all are in jail. Uh, what is Turkey going to lose? It's going to lose its EU membership, and if it's not careful, it's NATO membership. So there is an overhead cost. And I would say that my final thought to you is that please understand that all this stuff is shit just got real for us all. And we, could, we are the most talented generation and education, educated generation ever. So why should, we, why should we put up with the stuff that people want to do to us? And more importantly, why should we become internal exiles in a society? Look at, look at Brighton. But what, what would become of Brighton in a, in a, in a country run by right-wing xenophobes? You can't let it happen. Uh, it did happen. You can't let it happen again. So... That's my final thought. Thank you.